All right. Thank you all again for joining us this afternoon for the International Association of Woodcarvers. Today is September the 12th, 2020. And today we have a special guest on with us. We have Mr. Alec Lacasse on that's going to be carving uh, faces in cottonwood bark. Uh, before we get started with Alec, I'll go through the list of things that we have lined up coming up uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, next week, we're going to have Daniel Clay from Knoxville, Tennessee. He's going to be on uh, he has a company called Saturday Box Company, and he's going to be do, doing chip carving. Um, so we'll have Daniel on next week. Uh, on September the 26th, we'll have Flex Cut. Uh, they're going to come on and talk about uh, their tools and sharpening their tools. Uh, so we'll have them here. On October the 3rd, we'll have Catherine Overcash on. She's going to talk to us about bark houses. Catherine's actually on today. Hey, Catherine. Um, that, that is October the 3rd. And then October the 10th, uh, we will have James Ray Miller on. Uh, he's a flat plane carver and he's gonna come on and do a demonstration on uh, carving flat, flat plane caricatures. Um, so having said all that, just a couple of other things. Uh, don't forget that Dave Stetson's having a Zoom class at the end of the month uh, on carving a Santa Claus from a rough out. Uh, if you're interested in that class, contact Dave Stetson. Uh, Chris Hammock is still doing on, ongoing Zoom classes on design and caricature. And then Kevin Applegate's also doing classes. He's a CCA member. Uh, you can find his classes on secondalarmwoodcarving.com. Second is with a, it's a, the number two in ND. So secondalarmwoodcarving.com if you want to check out Kevin Applegate's classes. Uh, having said all that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Alec. And Alec, if you'll go ahead and take it on. Thank you. Yeah, geez, why all that boring stuff beforehand? I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, guys, no, I really appreciate being invited today. It's an honor. Um, I have, I'm a new, new member of the, uh, the Instagram uh, group. If it, it doesn't really work that way, there's no group, is there? I'm a new member, a friend of the uh, Daily Woodcarving Instagram, and I love it. Really cool to see what you guys are doing. And they asked me, uh, they said someone brought brought me up in one of your meetings, and so I thought I would do a little demo for you, and um, primarily focusing on cottonwood bark, um, as was already mentioned, and so this will be just that, a demonstration on carving uh, cottonwood bark. So as far as the format, uh, I guess we'll, we'll kind of get into the, to the meat of the carving, um, and then is it normal for people to ask questions afterwards? Is that kind of yeah, we can do it however you want, Alec. If, uh, cool. if they want to ask during the discussion, we can do that. Or if you'd rather them wait till the end, we can do that. Nope. They also throw stuff out in the chat. Um, so I can read those off as they come through on the chat. Great. Beautiful. That works great. I have no, uh, no problem with questions in the middle of it. That's great. It gives me something to talk about. So cool. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me again. So let's get to it. So um, I've been doing uh, face carving in some form or fashion uh, since I was 12. And so I'm 26 now. So 14 years I've been uh, doing carving. I um, started, I, I showed up to the woodcraft store just one too many times. And the uh, manager came, to, uh, came up to me and said, um, basically, like, what are you doing here? And uh, he, he, I explained that I was into carving and uh, I'd been carving for a little while. And uh, he said, do you have any pictures? I pulled up a few pictures and uh, he, he called the manager's manager, whoever that is, somewhere who was visiting, I guess the guy who was in charge of the store and came out and said, have you considered teaching? And I was, uh, let's see, I was 16, right? So I said, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course I've considered it. Absolutely, I'm into teaching. And, uh, and he said, good. Uh, and he said, uh, how old are you? And I said, 16. He said, well, you're 18 now, kid. And that was my first exposure to uh, that, that, that class, the class that followed maybe a month after that um, conversation. Uh, it was a class of, I think I had 16 students. It was huge uh, for my first class, but I really enjoyed it a lot and I fell in love with teaching. Um, so on top of wood carving, uh, for, me, for me, teaching isn't really um, kind of something that I have to do to make a living as an artist. It's something that I really like to do and I'm pretty blessed to be able to do it. So um, that said, uh, I, I started doing fine art shows uh, right around that age, 16, 15, 16, and started selling my work at the same time. So 
uh, that probably ramped up quicker than my teaching did. Uh, and I would say probably because I didn't know what I was talking about with regard to teaching. So I'm glad that didn't ramp up uh, any quicker than it did. Because I got, I got some experience in selling art and being an artist uh, professionally. And now I feel like I can actually share without um, uh, being a complete lot pulling stuff out of my butt. So that's good. It's always a good thing. Um, yeah, so from, from age uh, 16 on, I started doing the professional art show circuit and uh, maybe age 22, I started traveling and doing uh, some classes, workshops around the nation. And that's what I've been doing. Of course, COVID stopped that for most of us. Those of you who are watching who do teach, um, I know Dave's here and a few others, but uh, it's definitely been kind of a weird time, uh, but we've adapted. We're, we're getting clever. Um, I started a wood carving school. Um, and that basically uh, allows people to interact with me on a one-on-one -on -one level outside of the videos that they subscribe to. Um, and, and so that's something that folks, um, I believe we have an offer code for you. Um, you can get that. I'll, I'll mention that at the end of this, it gives you 20% uh, off the school. It's a monthly thing. Uh, so, so I've been, been able to make do, but, uh, but beyond that, I've uh, been just doing commission work. I'm looking at a whiteboard on the wall with a bunch of commissions that I've been putting off. So, and then the fun ones I've been doing. So I don't know if you guys can relate to that, but uh, yeah. So anyway, let's get to it, huh? how about it? I've got a piece of cottonwood bark mounted to this fixture here. This is a really simple setup. I actually learned it from a guy named Ron Adamson. I'm not sure if uh, those of you out there know Ron, I'm gonna move my camera here. Uh, Ron is a carver in Libby, Montana. And uh, he's an excellent carver at that. And someone who I've looked up to for a long time. I'm gonna talk while I grab this light. Um, he, he does this sort of uh, style of carving, low relief and bark as well. And uses this same fixture. So the, the setup is really simple. It's just a, it's a two by six. I have mounted to a wall with uh, two by fours, screwed in as two studs. And I have a mounted light. This is just like a spring drafting lamp. Sits up top. I have a couple of auxiliary lights um, for photography and videography here for the school. And I just tuck this bad boy here. I've got a magnet strip with tools nearby. Probably can't see all of them, but um, I've also got my, my bark mounted to a three quarter inch piece of ply that is screwed into the piece of wood at two spots, the top and bottom. I'm just using inch and five eighths drywall screws and I'm trying to stay away from the center of the piece so that I'm not carving into the screws and ruining my tools. But this piece of plywood has some holes drilled in it and it allows me to fit different sized pieces of bark to it. And I just clamp this to the fixture with these two inch spring clamps and that's more than enough for most uh, softer wood projects. I do do some carving and butternut. This is actually my latest project for the school. It's a female face. Um, I don't know if you can even see it, but so I do do uh, materials in other woods and I say do do on accident sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so this is, uh, this is the setup. This is a piece of cottonwood bark I grabbed when I was in Montana last. We make these trips every year out to Montana. And my friend and I, uh, Ben Liu, have been going the last two years. He's a video a guy, a, filmographer, a film dude. I don't know if filmographer is the real thing. I don't know if that's a right word, but he makes videos and movies. And so he came and documented our last trip. That'll be up soon, I'm sure, somewhere. It's called Bones. It's a short film. Um, but yeah, this came from that trip. So to start, I'm Mounting, of course, the piece of bark to the fixture, and I'm using a large gouge. I usually use the number four 25 millimeter uh, Stubai, which if you're using Swiss made tools, you're probably gonna use something closer to a three, um, but they're, they're comparable, uh, those sizes. Most of the alternative tools to Stubai are um, a, a step lower in terms of the um, scoop. So. I use this large wide tool to do most of my roughing in and some of my detailing, especially when I'm working in a demonstration and I'm working more quickly than I normally would. Um, so I'll start by kind of clearing the surface of the material.
Right, so I'm already trying to make a semi-round surface here. <clears throat> and the thing that drew me to cottonwood bark was the sound. I love the sound of a sharp tool zipping through the cottonwood bark. And I love the color. It's got this reddish kind of brown streak to it. And it's so, so soft and even. And it almost, it's just got such a mild grain presence, meaning that you can move in multiple directions without having to worry about it uh, being fickle and chipping on you. Once you get into the, the actual, you know, the meat of the bark, it's really great. For those of you who haven't tried it, I highly recommend cotton bark. Um, okay, so I clear off the surface and then I start to define the proportions of the face. Now, I normally, when I carve, am not doing what I'm about to do, but for the sake of the demonstration, I'll show you kind of the, the internal metric I'm using for proportion. It's a very, very simple one. It's just this uh, kind of idea of keeping things in line. Now, most of the time when I'm carving, again, uh, these rules are flexed substantially. So the proportions of the face aren't necessarily going to be exactly as I explain them now, but they're somewhere within this range and it gives us a nice framework when we don't have a picture to scale, to reference and measure from. So that being said, let's say our face is gonna be somewhere around three and a half inches. I don't want the face to be too big because I don't want to run out of room, uh, the, the space uh, surrounding the piece. So let's draw, let's say a circle and a half, right? The classic oval face shape. We'll start with that. I'm actually gonna bring this line up a little higher. So we've got some messy lines here just indicating the oval shape. So I'll split this oval in half, right? We'll say this is the top of the head, this is the bottom of the head, and we'll go right about halfway in between those two lines. So this is, a, this is the, what one might think would be the eye line. Generally with male faces, the eye line sits just above the center. And so you can draw a secondary line just above it, indicating the, uh, the, the top of the eye. Usually this midpoint line it, it indicates, if it indicates anything, where the lower lid either meets the ball of the eye or somewhere at the base of the lid where the, the, the first part of the lower lid meets the, the this kind of like zygomatic region, uh, if I'm using that. Uh, word properly. I think it's the zygomatic or maxilla region. Maxilla region. So um, draw that and I'll split this shape in half again. It's getting kind of messy here. So we've got our top of our head, bottom of our head, eye line, nose line, which is just this shape split in half from the eye to the base of the chin. Um, if you have a, a notepad handy and you're trying to draw, that can be helpful to keep this stuff in your brain. Then I'll take the space and I'll divide it between uh, into thirds. So one, two, three. So, so basically I'm just dividing in half. So I'm just uh, dividing this whole shape in half, this shape in half, this shape in half. And then finally, the space between the bottom of the nose and the bottom of the chin is divided into thirds. Okay, and, and this first and second third indicates the upper and lower lip, right? So if I'm carving a whimsically bearded dude, I'm not super worried about the uh, position of the chin and lips because maybe they're mostly covered by hair. In some cases they might not be, but in most cases at least the upper lip is. Um, with this project, uh, let's see, we've got 40 minutes. So does anyone have a preference? Is there, is there a speak first or whoever, or is there anyone that's been really wanting to see one thing in particular or any input on that? Because I can kind of go. Uh, multiple directions with this. We talked about the face, but any thoughts on that? I'll just make a decision if, if no one speaks up. How about an Indian? Okay, yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. So we will care about the mouth, the lips, the face, uh, you know, the lower part of the face. So that being said, uh, we can start with actually the roughing in the face. I won't do a lot more drawing on this. I can, I can go into depth, but uh, that's stuff that um, I cover in more detail in this school and will probably subtract from the demo since I want to actually get some carving done. Um, so I'm going to use the number four to create a, basically a stop cut, if you will, coming right below the chin. And right away, I'm going to start to get the curve of the base of the face. And then I'm going to come up. Here. 
So I've got about an inch worth of depth already. Isn't that awesome? Cottonwood bark is so soft. Within seconds, I've got about an inch, an inch you know, so that's a 25 millimeter number four, so that's about an inch. We're there. So I'll get a little more depth here. Let's say we're drawing a couple of braids beneath the um, neck. So I'll use the the four turned upside down. Let me see if I can get a little closer for you guys so you can really see what I'm doing a little more clearly. Just bear with my movement. That'll help. So I'll use the four, I'll turn it upside down and I'll use the natural curve of the tool to create the beginning of these braid mounts. So really all we've got here is this like triangle and this ledge of the chin. Okay, next I'm going to start the stop cut above the head. So I'm not worried about this material coming off because frankly, the natural framing is already kind of busted. The, this continuation is not there, so I'm not worried about this uh, material up top coming going away. In fact, this would be the kind of project that I would probably take a bandsaw to the top of this and just carve the face all the way back or the head. So I'm just starting at this line just above it and I'm moving quite a bit of material. Okay, so at this point I'm probably, I'm going to say an inch and a half back with a slight curve at the top and bottom. Okay, and I'll bring it a little tighter. We're looking a little distant. Okay. All right, next I'm going to do um, a little cut that is a very tricky one. And Actually, before I do that, let's round this forehead a bit or this kind of hair area. I'm just gonna take the hard edge off of this top part here. Again, kind of rounding it over. Everything I've done thus far, including the initial rough in, has a semi-round shape to it. <clears throat> All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is part the hair, actually. This seems a little counterintuitive. I almost started with something else, but let's do this instead. Let's start with the part. So I'm kind of using the vor again turned upside down to create a little separation, two mounds on either side. Hopefully you can see that well. If anyone's having trouble seeing, feel free to let us know when I can position the camera a little different. Yeah, so, so I've created this part and now I'll do the cut that I faked you out with earlier, which is the uh, kind of the space of the mounds of the eye uh, where that where that kind of starts. So I'm going to go, ooh, I got a sneeze. It passed. Okay, so I'm gonna make a cut with this. Uh, this is a 20 millimeter number nine, <clears throat> pre-curved chisel. And I'm gonna come across the line that we indicated is the eye line. So I'm staying below that line, but I'm creating a little valley here and that's stretching across the face. I'm not afraid to get a lot of depth here because most of this forehead and area below the forehead will be coming back. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to get the nose to come forward, right? And with a carving that is <clears throat> being completely roughed out uh, right before our eyes, we have to remove a lot of material early on to get that nose to come away from the forehead and the just surrounding areas below it. So I'm going to bring the forehead back once I've done so, but first I'll take the a marker and I'll define a center line here. Kind of helps me to keep things in proportion. 
Alex, could you tell us where that uh, sheetrock screw is in relation to the face that you're doing right now? Yeah, yeah. So at this point, it's right above the face. So this could be, this could pose a challenge, but I'm not using so long of a screw that I'll hit it um, if I go um, to the depth that I'm going, right? So I'm not going a whole lot further in than that in this piece. Um, but at some point, especially if I end up taking advantage of this, obviously I'll take it off of the backboard and then I'll, I'll trim it clean. But yeah, it's just above this uh, cut here. So it's right about there. So Thank I want to, yeah, yeah. Ideally on this one, it would be even a little higher. Uh, if I were to go back, I'd place the screw up a little, a little higher. So it would be less, even less likely to hit it. Okay, moving forward here. I had coffee today, so, and by today I mean like 10 minutes ago. So we'll redraw that eye line in. I'm gonna draw a triangle here, indicating um, this kind of space that we're not going to touch just yet. And on the outside of the triangle, beneath this ridge, I'm going to use the same number nine, 20 millimeter to come on either side of the nose. Using a scooping motion, there aren't any hard lines here. I'm using big scooping tools to create soft, soft lines. We've got a little punky area in here. That'll be fun for us to mess with later. All right, so big, deep dish-shaped cuts happening below this ridge. All right, and I'll go ahead and tighten this up a little bit to those lines we drew earlier. <clears throat> see if I can reposition this to get it over my shoulder so you can see. It might be a little too close for me to work. Okay, there we go. All right, now that I've done this, I'm going to move the camera so you can see what we're, what we're after here in terms of depth. See that? So you can see I brought this material back. Um, I'll actually leave the camera in that position for this next cut. I'm gonna bring the forehead back. So I'm using that four, one inch number four, and I'm going to take forehead material back. What that looks like from the front. And again, that round shape, maintaining that round shape. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm getting that nose to come forward because I'm staying away from this triangle that we've drawn. The triangle is not the final destination for our nose, obviously. We're not looking for a triangle because frankly, the nose isn't really a triangle shape, <clears throat> uh, but we do want some sort of uh, indication for us to stay away from this area for now. So I choose the triangle. All right, so once I've done that, I can bring the material down below the nose. So I'll make a sort of stop cut, if you will. It really isn't a stop cut because I'm gonna use a, a gouge or this is actually a number 11 veiner. This is, I'm gonna say it's an eight millimeter veiner and it's just basically a very steep U. I'm sure most of you know that, but I'm going to cut below our nose here. So we've got the nose line which bisects the um, uh, eye and chin area in half. So I'm going to use the veiner to kind of define the bottom of that. I could totally use the four and I'm using the four, this one inch four again to bring material down below it. Again maintaining that curve natural curve. All right, then I'll taper the nose back. I'm not taking material away from the tip. I'm tapering it back into the forehead area with the four. And I'm going to go across the bridge with my nine, this is that 20 millimeter nine again. Just across the bridge, I'm not taking the ball of the nose down. and carving back to that point. 
Again, being careful not to take too much of the ball of the nose back just yet. Okay, so we've got a strange looking Frankenstein man. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the nose. Um, most people, when they carve the nose, they end up taking the ala, pushing it too far forward by carving the ala too soon. So I wanted to protect us from doing that by demonstrating that the ala, the ball of the nose uh, and the ala are separated um, on the profile view of the face. So I'm using my face as an example, but you can see what I'm talking about. The bulb, the bulbous part of the nose here, the ball of the nose is pushed forward ahead of the nasal flares that kind of go into the ball of the nose, right? So our concern here is that we don't put our nostrils way up too far and then start undercutting too early. That's probably the biggest mistake that I see when people carve the nose. That being said, I'm gonna taper on either side of the imaginary ball. Okay, I can draw it so it's not so imaginary. So I'm gonna use my four and turn it uh, at a 45 degree angle to the piece and start to taper this, the corners of this triangle back into the sweep of the face. You bored yet? No, this is great. Keep going out. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so let's see. We've got our profile I'll show it to you. How about it? Can you see what we're doing here? We've got the ridge of the brow. We've got this hump of the nose, and then this area is going to have to come back quite a bit, and I'll do that now since you've got a nice angle. Hopefully my junk back there isn't too distracting. I'm going to taper this area back, getting the roundness. Cool beans, all right. Now I'm gonna leave the camera there because this is kind of an interesting uh, switch up. Uh, I'm gonna use my marker to indicate the hairline and I wanna push the hair back. So I'm going to draw a line from the top of the head that kind of almost splits the ball in half and that will be our hairline. I'll do it on both sides even though you can't see this other side here. So I'm gonna use my number four to create a separation between the forehead and the hair. Carving to that line, the nice thing about the cottonwood bark is you can carve and lift and not completely lose your, your, uh, your line, if you understand the grain direction, of course. Um, if you're more comfortable, use a nine to create this separation or an 11, this is that eight millimeter 11 I was using earlier. Carve that line and create that separation from the hair and the nose. So what that looks like from the front, let me reposition that so you can see it. Looks like this. So he still looks like Frankenstein. This is where most people get discouraged and feel like they're failures and they're not good at wood carving. I should give up if they've not carved the face before at least to to have felt the emotions the, the ones that are all too familiar to those of us who carve faces where you kind of forget if you even know what you're doing and then you get discouraged because your 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 homie here is kind of looking like uh frankenstein but alas we shall save him from his frankenstein look Okay, so I'm taking material away from the bottom of the face right now. I'm just narrowing up the face a bit, thinning it up. Beautiful crack right here. This is gonna be, oh, wonderful crack. Can you see that? Oh yeah, how about that? Look at this. Perfect for our demonstration today. I'm gonna soak that while we're talking. By soak it, I mean. Give it a little wood glue, a little, little super glue. Wish it was never born. So I'm gonna flake 
this piece off. If you guys have a compromised area on your part on your carving, always better to repair that area before you've started adding very important detail. So if there's an area where I see a major crack or a fault and I can dislodge it and, and secure it by either using glue or something along those lines, filler or something, I'll always do that earlier on in the piece as to preserve the, the carving because there's no sense in waiting until you're 95% done with the carving and you have to screw stuff up that you spent hours doing, right? So always do your repairs early on. And if you can, you know, you know, if there's, again, if there's a crack or a fissure, just take the piece off, just wedge your knife in, do whatever is necessary to finish that um, cracked piece and so that you can reattach it. Uh, that being said, that, that should be pretty good. He's floating in midair, so this little cracked area, so I'm not sure what will happen, but that's okay. All right, so going forward here, I've defined the hairline. We've got the brow ridge. We've got the kind of almost pyramid shape of the nose. This is my favorite angle to show people when I'm talking about the face. Um, let's see if I can, not my face, I don't want that. Let's see if I can turn this camera around. Come on. Okay, you're gonna be that way. favorite angle right here to show people when I'm talking about the pyramid of the nose or the getting getting the appropriate dimension hello so what I'm after here is a um, I wish I had my whiteboard nearby it's over across the room from me I'll just carve it and show you what I mean so I'm actually using the four coming up to the ball And I'm getting that separation, kind of using the, the edge of the tool to round the ball a bit. Hey, you. Okay. But my point here is for you to notice how dimensional this is. Often when people carve the nose, they'll take the ala and they'll start carving them right away. So they'll be somewhere up here, here, and here, the flares. When I say ala, I'm talking about the, the nose flares, like the nostrils. They'll start carving them and then they'll get way back in here and start carving underneath them, excavating, so they look like some, I don't even know, uh, there's nothing human that I can relate, whatever it is they're carving to. It's very scary. I recommend you stay away from it. But I'll show you from this angle, we'll try something new. You guys, you guys, uh, you deserve something new. I'm tired of doing the same stuff over and over. Here we go, so I'm gonna use this 11, and uh, new camera angles for everyone. And I'm gonna carve the ALA. Right now I might use a V tool for this step. I might use a knife, but today I've picked the small 11. It's really incidental. People focus on tools, I think, um, to an extent that's almost unhealthy, you know? I mean, coming from the guy whose wall is covered in old English, you know, carving tools. I'm a hypocrite for saying it, but I don't think you need as many tools as you probably have. I, I don't, I certainly don't. Maybe I'm just talking to myself. That being said, I'm making this little C cut under here on either side. And then I'll take my nine, that 20 millimeter nine we were using earlier. And I'm gonna to come to those little sort of C shaped cuts on either side. And I don't know if that angle is showing you exactly the beauty of what we're doing here. So I'm gonna move the camera so you can appreciate it a little better. Oh, my demonstration wins for shakiest camera if you guys give out awards at the end of the year. Okay, so, so you can see now these two kind of C-shaped cuts that define the outside line of the nasal, uh, sorry, the um, ala or uh, the flares of the nose. And I'm coming underneath the nose once again with the 11 redefining the bottom of the nose, separating it from what will be soon the mound of the mouth. Bringing the mound of the mouth back, kind of rounding it out. One of my students recently said, this is the barrel of the mouth. And I've been, I've been hijacking that term. Um, I, like the, I like the word barrel for one, and I think it does a good job of describing the round shape. Okay, 
Guys, you're awfully quiet. This is weird. Alex? Yes. Uh, would this be the same principle if you were doing a wood spirit or a, a mountain man, I should say? Uh, would this be the same principle? I know that the cheeks are different and the forehead on an Indian, but would this still be the same principle that we'd be doing if we were doing a mountain man? As far as what aspect of it? Uh, the structure, uh, the, the yeah. cheeks, bones, totally. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Do the drawing. Uh, give yourself an idea of uh, the proportion, you know, that as it fits the piece of wood. But then remember that your lower line, your, your lower stop cut isn't going to be at the line of the chin because you have a beard if you've got a mountain man, right? In most cases, right? So you're going to yeah. add the mass. So that's something to keep in mind when you're placing your, your mouth and doing the stop cut below, uh, below the mouth, the chin area. You're going to extend that area. So okay. maybe by... If your piece, say, is three and a half inches, your beard might be an extra three-quarter inch or, or inch, depending on Got how it. bushy. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No problem. What was your name? Oh, did I lose you? I think she's no, it's this. Evelyn. I just Evelyn, it. Thank, thanks for the question, Evelyn. Thank you. I'm gonna lose you for just a second. I'm just making sure I'm on the correct Wi-Fi here, so I'm not. I was set up because it looked a little grainy there for a second. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we're good. Cool. Good, all right, continuing onward. Not sure where we are for time. We started at three, we're at 3.40. So we've got a few minutes left. We probably won't cover the whole face so if we're realistic here, but we'll get somewhere, hopefully. Okay, so we've got the top of that forehead, the sockets, the nose, the mouth, the barrel of the mouth. Let's carve the uh, base of the chin here. So I use kind of a frown, if you will, to carve the chin and the chin sits in the last third between the bottom of the nose and the base of the chin right so let's draw these lines again we've got the bottom of the nose bottom of the chin let's draw a line and another line that that creates one two three spaces right so we've got the mouth lips somewhere in this area again i don't like rules like this i while i'm telling you these rules i'm imagining the people in my life whose faces break these rules so keep that in mind uh, but the mouth is generally going to sit somewhere in this first and second third. So the lower lips down here, upper lips somewhere up here in the first and second third. The chin's down in the last third. And that's what we're looking to do right now is carve that chin. So I'm using kind of a frown line right over that last third. And I'm actually coming into the sides of the face as well with some degree of depth with this uh, 11, this is that, um, I think I said eight millimeter 11, might be a six. Not super critical. Okay, and then I'm gonna round the barrel of the mouth with my four again. Bring the jowls or the jaw back and starting to round this area of the chin here, blending that into our little groove, our frown cut that we made. Okay, next really fun little uh, deal here is the nasal labia line, which is a very fancy way. My favorite way of saying the frown line because it makes me feel superior to everyone. <laughs> I am the master of the nasolabial fold. No, I'm not. Okay, so uh, basically I'm gonna just take the V-tool, if I can find my freaking V-tool. Come hither. Here it is. I have all these magnets to keep me organized. To what end? I don't know. All right, so the nasolabial lines, just the frown lines that go on either side of the flares, right? So I'm taking my V-tool. And okay, if you want a rule about where these lines go, so you're not giving them some crazy, scary, like joker lines, uh, you can use the um, 
the eyes as an indicator. So if you want to delay this part and work on the eyes, you can use the center of the eye uh, as a guide. So if you were to draw a line from the center of the eye and go to the bottom of the face here and here, that would probably give you a nice indication of where you can carve the nasolabial folds. And they come up and into these little C shapes we made earlier. And they kind of curve around. So I'm almost curving the V tool in and up back more towards me again. Same on this side. And coming around, rounding the ala. Okay, so we've got these nice defined frown lines. We'll get our four again, our big old one inch four, and soften the transition of the full, the mouth into this uh, kind of cheek area, if you will. Hey Alec, there's no need to rush. You take your time on uh, your carving there. Okay. Don't, you should, if you care at all about your members, you should be careful about what you say because I'll keep them here all night. I'll keep them here until 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We because I've got to- Man, don't worry. I've got, a, I've got a show, I've got to play some music tonight uh, at the local coffee shop. So I call it a show because it sounds cool, but really I'm just playing at a small coffee shop, some guitar and singing some songs. And uh, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, there's a girl I'm interested there, so it's gotta be good. So I'm, I, I just wanna let you know that uh, I make jokes, but I'm gonna have to leave at 7.45 p.m. at the very, very latest, so. I know, I know most of you want me to stick around and explain myself, but I can't, I can't go any later than 745, so I'm sorry. Thank you for setting the limitations. Yep, no problem, no problem. You still after that same girl? No, uh, uh, no. Uh, the, the girl, the girl, no. I'll just say no, I don't know what girl you're talking about, but I'm going to say no. Uh, <laughs> Because I'm just after so many of them, <laughs> you know. I don't know how many people know, but Alex is quite a musician as well. Thanks. Wow. You obviously haven't heard me play very much, but that's nice of you to say. <laughs> no, I am. I am what uh, I don't know. I, I was going to make a mean joke, but I, I actually can't say that I'm. Uh, you know what, let's just forget I even started saying something. Let's just get back to the carving. So I'm starting to bring the chin back. Let's get our little bird's eye, our bug's eye view, if you will, again. Show you the chin. Again, another mistake people make, similar mistake to, um, to the one they make with the nose. They end up with a flat nose with not very much dimension. Chin is another area requiring a bunch of depth and dimension, and most people aren't getting that. So I am taking the chin back on either side of our little uh, frowny line, if you will, but tapering it back. Give it lots of depth, guys. Stop making these flat faces. Nobody wants to see a wooden flat face. Okay, so we've got a nice jawline. Your mother does, I lied. Your mother wants to see your flat faces. And she will tell you that they're the beautiful, the most beautiful thing that she's ever seen. My mom did. She still comes over and tells me crappy carvings look awesome. And that's what moms are for. And if you don't have a mom anymore, find someone in your life who tells you your, your crappy carvings are awesome. Hey man, if your singing doesn't work out, keep the jokes up, brother. They're great. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Two things I shouldn't do, but I continue to do because I enjoy it. Them making jokes and playing music, both at the expense of my audience. You have to do some stuff in your life that you only you love. You know, about self care, guys. Who said your jokes were good? Wasn't speaking for all of us. <laughs> Okay, so can you see the, is that angle helping at all? Or is it just frustrating those of you who are putting up with my jokes and not recompensed by the good carving? Is that helping? Cool. I'm gonna just take your silence as a resounding yes. 
Dave, focus. <laughs> okay, here we go. Back to it. I like that Zoom just randomly shows me the last person who talked and that it focuses on them. And uh, I think that's great. So my forehead chipped off, so now I'm bringing it back. Even more, which isn't a problem. I don't know if you carvers have noticed this, when something flakes off and it forces you to level an area you didn't plan on leveling, if it's not like the nose or some very important part at the end of the carving, if it happens early on, it ends up benefiting you more than it ends up hurting you. I feel like I'm talking to myself. I feel like a crazy person talking to myself. Okay, so I'm coming on either side of the nose, again with that 20 millimeter V tool. Getting more depth and roundness to the ball. We've got a nice jaw here. We've, we've pushed the jaw area back, our chin. Now for the mouth. Right, so let's see, we've got our third. Splitting this mound in half. I'm going to use a knife in this case. You could very well use a V-tool following the line of the mouth, but I'm going to use a knife that's somewhere in between a bench knife, which is a little heftier and detail knife, which is just slightly smaller and thinner. This is my favorite carving knife made by Dave Lyons. Shout out to Dave Lyons. I'm gonna start by making a stop cut and a relief cut right at this line. And I'm gonna continue the stop cut and the relief cut. Okay. Now, my concern here is that the lower lip is pushed further in, generally speaking, than the upper lip. The upper lip generally comes forward a bit more than the lower lip. Uh, and that's the case for, I would say probably more than the, it's the case more than not. Uh, but then again, you know, I'll say this rule and then I'll look at my students and sometimes two thirds of them have, uh, lips that are even in terms of the way they protrude exactly the same or sometimes the lower lip will come forward more so these are these are rules uh, meant to be broken I, would, I think the most helpful thing for me is looking at reference photos i use reference photos a lot when i'm carving even just for fun um, because they help me to uh you know basically there's almost nothing i can learn in carving or, or less than I'd like to think that I can learn from one carving that I can take and directly apply to the next carving. Because each face has new, a new set of rules and a new set of proportions. Um, and so it's, it's more interesting long term to have um, reference photos because it, it, it keeps you occupied and it keeps you on a new path every time. Each project. Okay, so I'm starting to bring the nasolabial line back again with my V tool, this kind of frown line. Okay, and then I come on either side of the corners of the mouth that have opened up. And I emphasize depth in these corners. Emphasize depth in these corners because I don't want a, I don't want a mouth that sits flat it almost looks like fish lips. I want them to be set in the face. So I'll use the knife to clean that area up a bit. And I'll bring this, this area here is called the, the philtrum. Um, a lot of people call it the snot trough. I like to call those people um, weird. 
But to create the filtrum, I'll use, this is an old number nine, an old English uh, CJ, uh, C, uh, S, J, Addis. <laughs> I can't talk. An Addis tool. I think it's like Civil War era, pre-Civil War era. But I'm kind of going in with that nine. That's probably a, I'm going to say a, a six millimeter number nine, at most an eight. And I'm coming in from the bottom of the upper lip into the nose, into the septum. And that gives us our filtrum. All right, eyes. Let's do a little uh, talk about the eyes. And I think we'll probably cut out pretty shortly because we're getting close to that hour mark. And I know most of you would prefer probably not to be here until 7.30. I would never want to put you through that. That'd be horrible. Okay, uh, any questions before I move on here? Thoughts, concerns? Any of you ready to, to, to tell me how you really feel about me? You know, or, Alex, or maybe you're a great guy. Ah, that means I do lot. have a question though, if you don't mind. Um, how often do you find your uh, Sharpening your tools, working with that wood all the time. Um, usually every 30 seconds when I'm not doing a demonstration because of the uh, sand and deposits. Um, That's what I was wondering, yeah. Every 10, 10 seconds to 30 seconds. Um, yeah, it feels that way at least. No, actually probably like um, every, every at least once uh, between each carving, I'll bring the tools over to the polisher. Sometimes in the middle of a carving. Um, but always, if I'm transitioning from a bark carving to a hardwood carving, I'll take my tools to the polisher, sometimes to the sander to reshape because these pieces of bark do screw the crap out of your tools. Great. Uh, Thanks for your time. Yeah. Screw the crap out of your tool. What does that even mean? I don't know what I just said. So I'm coming in the corners of the eyes at this point. Let me move this so you can see what I'm doing. Get right up on there. One of the areas of greatest depth in the face uh, is right here in the corners of the eyes on either side of the ball. So I'll take my number nine. This is a six millimeter number nine. And I'll come on either side of the nose. And I'm scooping here. And I'm creating the beginning of the mound of the eye. I'll we'll also take the same tool um, and I'll come beneath the eye. This is called the uh, mid-face groove. It almost parallels the nasolabial line or nasolabial fold and it comes right above it. If this is our nasolabial angle, the uh, mid-face groove is about the same, parallels it, but it's just above it. And the mid-face groove transitions into the malar bag. And the malar bag is the most prominent bag under the eye. It's kind of the fatty tissue, the, the, the line and the fatty tissue right under the eye here. So we're, we're kind of already starting to define that. It's going to give us a nice um, eye mound. So once I've gone in these corners, started to come under the eyes to get the ball, I'll take my knife and I'll start to soften the transition of that mound or that uh, groove we just cut. So I'm basically cutting it away down below that channel and I'm taking off the hard edges above because I want to leave this mound here, this mound of the eye. All right, so hey, Alex, notice- my, Yes, sir, of course. Chat, um, how do the proportions differ for a female face as compared to the face you're doing? Well, I'm definitely not any uh, expert on carving female faces. I'm a growing uh, person with regard to that. Um, but I will say that the female face tends to have eyes more centered on the head, for sure. There's more fatty tissue. So the lines aren't usually quite as sharp or defined. The jaw has a less dramatic angle. Um, the mouth tends to be a little more centered between the nose and the chin. Um, there are, uh, you know, kind of like us, usually the brow ridge might be a little softer. 
the nose, the angle of the nose from the profile, if we're looking at the profile of the nose here, you're gonna notice on the female that there is a negative slope instead of a positive one. So you get the fairy nose effect. So it'll curve down and up at the tip. Whereas with the male face, usually it'll either be more straight or sometimes more crooked. Of course, these are general rules, so they're not always the case, but. Uh, the forehead also on the female face tends to be a little flatter. Um, and more forward, um, not more forward, but um, more consistently flat. I think flat is probably the best way of putting it. Um, the, the angle of the male forehead is usually greater. Uh, it's usually pushed back. Like so. Hopefully that answers your question. Let's move this back so you can really see what's going on here. Bringing the chin back, hollowing the cheeks. I'll use the knife to define the edges. Your eyes kind of always naturally go to the outside of a project, um, the outline of a, of a shape. You kind of learned that in, like, I think it was Ceramics 101 was the first class where our instructor said that. Your eyes always are drawn to the lines of a piece or the outermost shapes. So I'm often kind of maintaining um, uh, a look at the, the outline of the face. And right now, if I look at the outline of the face, I notice it's way too wide. So I'll take my knife and I'll start to narrow. I'll start around the hollow of the cheek. And the temples at the forehead. You can also use a fork for this. Many of the times I'm using of a knife, it's, it's interchangeable with the four, especially in roughing in, because it's a semi-flat, large tool. Okay, so I'm starting to narrow the face. Are we for time, so we're an hour in. Bring the hair down a bit. Soften the angle of the brow. Okay. So I've just narrowed the face up a bit. I can do so more. I'm also going to take the brow and raise it a bit. Less dramatic of an angle and raise it. I'm also going to take the corners of the bridge as they transition, the bridge transitions into the. Oh, there's a, that chip again. Get our V tool out for this. Transition the uh, bridge of the nose. They can use our knife. Like so. So if I make a more dramatic line here, the transition between the brow and the, the bridge of the nose, it'll look more aggressive, more angry, like so. Also, I'll create a hollow under the chin. The angle in and upward to define the jaw a bit more and bring that neck back. Show what that looks like in a second. I'll move the camera so you can see the angle of the neck.
Greetings. I think a form of alien life is trying to communicate with us via their washing machine. Whatever that was, their vent, some heater vent or something. Face from coming along the sides of the face. This is all boring stuff. This is all kind of like fine tuning. Often there's a little dr a ridge here. Forehead. And by ridge, I mean just a, a soft um, scoop, creating uh, some definition. This is the frontalis muscle. I like to think of the forehead as being kind of like one, two, three kind of planes, even though they're really not planes. They're kind of rounded, semi-rounded shapes. Reminds us to taper the temples back, get that nice roundness of the forehead. So I, I kind of bring this area one and three back a bit. That gives us some nice shapes for the forehead. Okay, so in carving the profile, I'm going to use my V tool to of the ALA from that profile. Again, this is something that is uh, important to note. I'm not undercutting. So I'm not coming far into this corner and, and cutting underneath the ALA until I've set the depth. So I'm using the side of the V tool to bring everything on either side of the line that we just carved back, rounding the ala, separating the ball from the ala, emphasizing that mid-face groove we talked about earlier that kind of runs parallel with the nasolabial fold or the, or the frown line. Mallard bag underneath that. Both sides, so you can't see what I'm doing on the other side. Sorry about that. These are the mannequin lines, lines that come almost similar uh, shape to the nasal labial folds here, but they exist right at the transition of the upper and lower lip and usually are on uh, more prominent, prominent on older people, right? And so this guy's going to have some crazy looking mannequin lines. Okay. I'm going to turn the, I can't, we've already decided that I can't turn this godforsaken camera around. So you're going to have to deal with this awkward position. So we had a couple of chips and flakes. This is the nature of rushing through a carving project. Bad things happen, more bad things happen than when you're taking your good old time. Um, yeah, so should I, yeah, I think we're pretty well over our time at this point. Um, I could talk more about detailing the, the eyes and the nose and the mouth, uh, but I don't wanna keep you guys much longer. Um, but you can get a, a pretty decent idea of where we're headed with this carving. I'm applying some of the principles um, that I mentioned earlier about proportion, the eyes just above the center of the mound, nose halfway between that space, mouth um, in between the bottom of the nose, bottom of the chin, uh, upper lip, the first third, lower lip, and the um, second third. The lines of the mallard bag, of course, there's a whole lot that needs to be done on this carving. Um, 
I'm doing a wood carving workshop um, on carving the face. Uh, that's September 30th, so a couple of weeks from now. That'll be a one-day event, five hours, and that will be. Um, I'm going to open the uh, open that event um, for um, so you can sign up in the next uh, probably probably by tomorrow. Um, I believe you can sign up on the site right now, um, but I'm going to have that uh, formally open uh, tomorrow. So if you want to get a jump on that early start, you can go ahead, check out my website, uh, alclacast.com. And I'm also giving uh, folks a discount on the school as well. If you're interested in that so, uh, for more information. Any questions? Anyone really? Alex, want to we have yeah. a couple in the chat. Go ahead. Go ahead. Alex, go when ahead. you're done with your carving and complete it, uh, how do you, I've, what finish do you put on it? Yeah. <clears throat> well, if I don't end up uh, burning the carvings, I um, use a I use a combination of uh, lacquer and uh, mineral oil. Sometimes I use mineral oil. So it's pretty simple. I'll just take the carving. I'll have two brushes next to me. I'll have two um, uh, natural bristle brushes. So I'll apply the finish. I'll wipe it off with a towel very quickly. This works even better with a poly, something that's slower drying. And I'll take a, the towel, of course, wipe it off. Then I'll use the extra brush to get in all the corners. And then I'll mm. set that aside, let that dry and repeat that process three or four times. So I'm getting a very thin buildup of finish on the carving. I don't want it to look plastic. I don't want it to look like uh, there's this uh, gooey buildup in the crevices, which often happens if you're spraying a carving or you're mm. just kind of loading up a carving with finish, so. Thank you. So it's, mm -hmm. so it's mineral oil that you said you used to? Or yeah, and sometimes good? I'll take the tiniest bit like the teeniest, tiniest bit of mineral oil on the very corner of a uh, dry brush, once the finish is dry, the lacquer that is, and I'll just kind of work it into the carving. And sometimes that brings luster, uh, mm. if I want a little more luster out of a carving. In the same way that someone would, would buff a carving with, um, you know, any sort of wax or um, bees, beeswax or whatever, you know. Petroleum. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Hey, Alex, from the chat, um, somebody wants to know if you do a carving like this start to finish, how long does it usually take? Um, I think there's like a really like annoying cliche answer where people say, well, it takes me 14 years. I, all the skills that I've developed over the years to finish a carving in under three hours. Um, but the, the reality is that's true. It does, you know, the, the experience that you gain builds up to, uh, and, and you can, uh, utilize the years of, of making bad carvings to help you make better carvings. Uh, so you're not just factoring in the time you put into it, you're, you're acknowledging the time you've developed your skill. Um, uh, but no, it's usually, you know, usually in my head, I'll plan out a carving and I'll say, I can get this done in, in six hours, something of this size. But it usually ends up being something like eight hours or 12 hours. Um, if I'm really, uh, especially if I'm using a reference photo and doing a commission carving, like if there's a reference uh, that the customer wants me to use. That's something that you know, eight hours, 12 hours, 14 hours, it can be really time consuming. Um, now it's a different story, like what I can do, I can make this car, I can finish this carving in you know, another 30 or 40 minutes uh, and, and it'd be decent and, it, and it'd sell uh, in, the, in the art show uh, marketplace. But in this time of Corona, what better thing have I got to do than, than whittle around you know, this carving, so. Alec, yeah, um, nice, nice job. Not the best one I've ever seen you carve, but yeah. Um, if you hadn't spent so much time telling us jokes, you might have had time to detail an eye. <laughs> How could I detail an eye? I'm too busy playing the guitar. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I think I appreciate that comment. So let me just recap. I did a shitty job and you wish I wouldn't have talked. <laughs> no, I could still do the eye if you want me to do the eye, if that's a consensus. Do an eye. Do an eye? Sounds real weird when you say it like that, but okay. I'll do an eye.
This is for Dave. This is for Dave for being a wiener. Okay, so this is this is the uh, the deal with carving the eye, right? There's there's one of two kind of general eyes that I'm that I'm, I'm generally carving here, right? So it's an exposed lid or a closed or hooded lid. So the hood is the piece of skin or the fold of skin that comes over the forehead and covers the upper lid. In this case, since we don't have a ton of time, I'm going to do a hooded lid. Um, I'll talk about the hooded lid. So very simply set up for that already, and I kind of uh, hinted at it here. Basically, I'm splitting this kind of round area here in half with my V tool. And I'm not going very deeply in here, but I'm going to come up into the corner of the forehead where it meets the, the uh, bridge of the nose. <clears throat> Okay. And I'm going to take back this material here. Right, so, so I basically decided that this is the upper lid or the uh, fold of skin covering the upper lid, right? And I'll do the same thing on the other side. You can use the knife. I'll show you what it looks like with the knife. So I'll come across up from this corner, down over. And I'll taper it. Can you see this? Yeah. Hoping Dave does a correction video, like a part two for this in his uh, demonstration, how to correctly carve the eyes. Okay. Okie dokie, artichokey. Okay, so you see what's going on here. We've got this upper hood and carving below it. So that comes from the profile. You can really see what we're looking at here. All right. Cool beans. We're good. We're straight. Okay. All right, so next I'll carve the lower lip. To carve the lower lid, I'll use my knife or even a VTOL will work. Let's grab a VTOL. Very close to that upper lid. It's probably even hard for you to see what I'm doing here. Just a, a sliver of an opening. I'll go over that line with my knife. Kind of creating an almond shape here. Also, Dave, I'm putting you in charge of auctioning this carving for me after this. So I'm hoping to get as much as possible. So if you can, you know, if you I, use whatever techniques you have to sell this, that would be great. I appreciate it. You need extra money to impress that girl this evening? <laughs> That's right. I need to buy myself a top hat and, uh, and, and a nice fur for her, for the lady as well. So, because this is the 1850s. No, seriously, buddy, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it, man. Coming from you, I do appreciate it. Also, Dave, I want to I want to take one of your classes next year in. Uh, it, it stinks because we usually, for those of you who are watching uh, who don't know, I, I travel and teach um, and uh, I, I run into Dave and I get to see him in his awesome classes and but I, I almost never am able to take the class and the, the couple of opportunities I've had at least because he is 
teaching at the same time I'm teaching. So it's like I get to be, you know, I get to talk to him afterwards, which is pretty awesome, but I never get to take his class. So take advantage of his classes online if you can, because he is super BA, an awesome, awesome carver. Well, you know, so, okay. I'll let you know when I have a beginner class coming up. Yeah, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to, uh, I'd love to be a part of that. That would be, I appreciate you even letting me know. That means a lot. So, yeah, something like, uh, <laughs> some, yeah, that would be, that will be nice. I love you. Get, I don't know if you have any, like, of those uh, stage, you know, go-bys where they're, I would, I'd like one of those. I probably actually could use, uh, use ago you know what's you know what's fun about carving faces you never i feel like there's no way i will ever be like totally comfortable i feel like i i feel like it's if, if i didn't have someone coming in the shop every once in a while to pull me away from a carving i would just work on it until kingdom come and it's uh it's what could happen very easily today if you guys don't literally tell me to stop. I'll keep going. Okay, so I've carved the lower lid and then I've gone ahead with a knife and I've cleared out the, the eye area. So I'm actually kind of turning the tool as I'm put, pushing it into this gap between the lower lid and this hooded area here. So the nice thing about the hood is I don't have to carve the upper lid. I don't have to worry about it so much. Um, and that gives us uh, a nice excuse to, to work less. Okay, so I'm getting extra depth in the corners. And I will maybe just hint at the upper lid by cutting in with the V tool from the corner of the eye. Let's see how close we can get here so you can really see what I'm doing. Cutting up into that space. I think you guys said to do AI, and now I'm doing two eyes. So, told you. Keep you here all night. Then I'm carving under the eye with the, the knife here. <laughs> Lots of depth in the corners. Take a little sandpaper. I know this is, I know some of you are cringing. How dare I use sandpaper before the carving is done? I, I use it a lot less, okay? Than I've ever used it. But often I like to, about this time in the carving, touch things up a little bit, blend. What the sandpaper does is it kind of takes the lines. And, and blends them so you can kind of better see what you have. A nice thing to do. But it does deposit grains in your carving. So keep that in mind when you are shaping. If you're removing a lot of material, probably hold off on sanding so much. Okay. Come in the corner of the mouth with a knife. And all the way across. Tuck that lower lid underneath the upper lid.
Get a couple of wrinkles in there. There are a couple of them up here. He looks kind of angry. So we'll emphasize these wrinkles. I'm not going straight when I'm carving wrinkles. I'm actually wiggling the back of the tool because often these lines aren't perfectly straight. There's a little, if you were to kind of magnify them, there'd be some under, like some movement. It's not a straight line. So I'm actually taking the tool and I'm moving it. You can see. And they're not, they're not always consistently all the way across. They break up. Sometimes a bit of a wrinkle will show up here and then there and then somewhere further down the road. Take the knife, come under the flare. Okay. We've sufficiently bored. Any other questions before I continue to hog up the rest of your Saturday afternoon? Anything else? You just send that to me and I'll get it auctioned off, buddy. What's your minimum? I need at least, um, we are, we, it's Corona, right? So I, I trade in, Start um, at bit, bit, I trade in Bitcoin. So I need, I, I need whatever the equivalent value of this carving is in Bitcoin. A starting bid of 15. 15 bitcoins. Sounds good. Whatever the hell that is. To be honest, I don't know what, the, what bitcoin is. I, I just wanted to say bitcoin at some point in this live stream. My approach to investments has been like... Uh, has been like the what is that grill that, that that rotisserie thing like set it and forget it that's been basically how i've gone about investing what's your website again aliclacasse.com a l e c l a c a s s e so it's like Emerald Lagasse's last name, but with a C instead of a G. Lacasse, L-A-C-A-S-S-E. Alec, like Alec Baldwin. Well, Alec, can people buy stuff off of your website, or do you have your stuff for sale somewhere else? Um, no, I'm probably the worst businessman uh, ever. So I, in terms of selling art, I don't sell a ton of it. Um, on my site right now, uh, but I do have a shop. There's one carving available up there, and there's the Lacasse Dubai wood carving set, which is a set of five tools that I use uh, most often. I use them every day, basically. Uh, they are um, unlike the average carving sets um, full of tools that you won't use, like weird random skews. Uh, they're just the tools that I, I use every day. So it's a five piece professional size Dubai wood carving set that's on the site. Um, but otherwise, uh, there's not much else available. Um, there's the school, which uh, probably your best bet if you're looking to learn more um, about what I do here. Uh, a little more in depth information. All this like fine tuning I'm doing, this stuff that I, I'm not really going into depth explaining here. That's stuff that I explain in the school. Um, and some other exciting things happening with the school as we move forward. So keep an eye on that. But yeah, we're getting there. Okay, guys, thanks for sticking with me for an hour and a half. I hope you had fun. Um, yeah, can I answer anything else before I scoop? Alec, uh, I just, uh, you're doing, this is fantastic, by the way. Cool. I did, I, I did my first uh, carving last night. Now you mentioned earlier that uh, you go on a material hunt and you go find yeah. a material. So yeah. my, my first carving did last night, my brother had a cotton tree fall down. It's about eight foot across, but the bark's only about an inch and a half thick. Are all cotton yeah. wood not created equal? Yeah, yeah, all cottonwood trees, unlike men, uh, they're not all created equal. So 
Um, they are, uh, d depending on the species, there's black cottonwood, there's, I guess there are, there are a few other varieties I've learned about recently, some of which I can't remember the names of, but there are uh, plains and eastern primarily, most commonly. And the plains cottonwood uh, tends to grow larger. Um, and the eastern cottonwood is what we have out here. Um, in Michigan, it's not the best. It doesn't typically grow as large. I don't know if it's just the species or if it's also the climate that makes it so. I just know that mostly Michigan bark and bark in the Midwest is not as good as the, the far Western bark. Even, even as far East as the Dakotas, they have great bark. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, can be, it can be tough. Even in those, uh, you know, Michigan, like Wyoming, uh, Dakota, Montana, those areas, it can be kind of hard to find the bark. Uh, but if you know where to look and you, and you find old, dead, mature trees, we call them bones because the bark is sheathed off or flaked off. And you can just see this dry white thing sticking up from the river sides out there. And that's what we're looking for. Okay. Um, yeah, so, it, you know, it's definitely a trick. There are these people that say, well, you know, we're there's no more good bark anymore. And I don't, they're definitely not right. Those aren't people looking for bark because there's great bark out West. You just have to look, follow the river sides and look for big down dead trees. And uh, you kind of have to work for it. But uh, it's mostly, it's mostly for me uh, a fun, like a fun journey. Um, I love traveling to my, Montana, Wyoming. Um, I'm pretty motivated to buy some property out there. I think one day it'd be a great thing to do. But, uh, you know, because I'm, cause I'm filthy rich, uh, so I just think about things like that, like buying properties. Uh, but, uh, no, I'm, I, no, I probably will never buy a property, but I want to. It's an awesome place to live, uh, live let alone, um, oh, I'm sorry, visit, let alone live. Uh, so if you get a chance to go out there to hunt for materials, it's worth checking out. Um, check out Libby. If you ever go out west to look for bark, Libby, Montana, where Ron is, uh, Ron Adamson, the guy I mentioned earlier, it's one of the most beautiful, actually it was originally slated to be um, the uh, Glacier National Park, but there, it wasn't passable enough. So you can just imagine how gorgeous it is. It's like insane. Uh, they won't let me over the border yet. <laughs> oh, you're in Canada. You're in Canada. Yeah. Right. eBay is always a good source for bark. You just look at the pictures to make sure it's the kind you want. Well, you I, go. Was, I got so excited. I drove a couple hours this morning and I picked up some at the, at the chipping away store and it was like mm -hmm. 15 bucks for a piece. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, I'll stick with my little inch and a half for now then. Mm -hmm. Dang. Yeah. If, no, you have, if you have some cottonwood and it's been sitting outside, um, can it get too old that you won't be able to carve with it? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I've got probably, what, three or four pieces in the shop right now that are total garbage because they got left out. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what if they're dry, but they're outside? I mean, can they get too hard? That's what I meant. Yeah, can they get too hard? Well, the hardness yeah. of the bark usually has to do with the uh, location of it on the tree, from what I've been told. Okay. <clears throat> And actually, if you, if you go, if you see a cottonwood tree around the base of the tree, the bark is hardest. And so if you collect bark that's in the middle part of the tree, up higher, you know, maybe uh, six or eight feet and above, you're going to get um, softer, easier, more workable, workable wood. I guess, okay. it's because, I guess it's because the sap kind of sits, uh, it settles down to the base of the tree. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. No problem. Great what work. If the bark Beautiful. is stored indoors. I'm sorry? What if the bark is stored indoors? Would it age the same First way? First of all, kudos. your background is awesome. Oh, thanks. I'm actually Amazing. on your right now. Man, that is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that because I, I am too, actually, in my studios. Uh, those are fake trees, but yeah, I live, I live underwater as well. Um, no, yeah, it, it, it stays pretty stable indoors. I haven't had problems with it. Have any of you had problems with bark sitting inside for too long? Not me. It's pretty stable. If you want thicker bark. Okay, good, thanks. If you want your bark thicker, store it on the sunny side of the house 
and soak it really good with Miracle Grow. <laughs> yeah. There you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, that does work. I can vouch for that as well. Another Just make sure we from Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely, that's one option. It's just time, it takes a while, but it's. All right, Alec, I'm gonna stop you here and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close down this meeting. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your uh, your abilities and your art and you're sharing it with us. So Thanks. thank you for that. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Alec, it was excellent. You were hey. excellent, Alec. Thank you guys so much. Go out and check out his website, check out his classes, sign up for those. Do it. Um, Alec, you're welcome back anytime. So come back again and uh, do another demo with us. Is Dave, is Dave doing a demo? Uh, Dave's done one. I may try to talk him into doing a live demo. Yeah, let me know. I want to tune in for that. All right. I'll get up with Dave later. Okay. All right. So okay. Uh, next, week, next week, tune in. Uh, we'll have Saturday Box Company on talking about chip carving, flex cut knives, Catherine Overcash, James Ray Miller. So tune in uh, every Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Alec, thanks again for everything. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you guys. Much luck to you all. Bye. All right. Thanks, Alec. Good luck Thank tonight. You. Thank, Thank you. you. I need it. I need it. Okay. <laughs>